Abraham Lincoln led the nation through its greatest crisis, but he couldn't have succeeded without the generalship of Ulysses S. Grant. Good afternoon and welcome to the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum in Springfield, Illinois for a special program celebrating the 200th birthday of U.S. Grant. Our program being presented both in person at the ALPLM today and for our audience watching around the state, across the country, and worldwide on the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum Facebook page. We'll show some rarely seen items from the library's collection illuminating Grant's life from his hard scrabble early years through the Civil War and his presidency to his retirement and authorship of his famous memoir. After the presentation, we'll have an opportunity for some questions and answers from both our in-person audience and for those of you watching on Facebook, please post your comments in the comments section below and we'll uh, get to as many questions as we can following the presentation. And for those of you in person, you'll have the opportunity afterwards to come up and view the objects up close and in person. Now, to bring you the story of General Grant, later President Grant, through the incredible artifacts in our collection that are rarely seen, here is our historian, Christian McWhorter. Good afternoon, Christian. Thank you, everybody, and thank you, Joe. Um, yeah, it's Grant's 200th birthday, and so uh, we were trying to think of a way um, for us to commemorate that here, given Grant's importance to the Lincoln story, but also because um, you know it has to do with the history of this institution as well, right? And I think some of you who've been to programs uh, that that uh, I and others have given here before, we we often point out that. Although we're called the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library Museum, um, for most of the existence of this institution, we were not known as that. We were the Illinois State Historical Library. We were founded in the 1880s. And the mission, uh, the original mission of this institution was to collect um, especially paper objects, manuscripts, books, things like that, on Illinois history. And so if you end up, uh, if you're collecting those kinds of things on Illinois history, you're going to end up with a healthy collection of Lincoln items, which is what we ended up with and led to uh, us being renamed and building that wonderful museum across the street. But you're also going to end up with Ulysses S. Grant stuff, right? And uh, we don't get as much of an opportunity to show off our Grant stuff uh, here uh, because the story focuses on Lincoln. We've been trying to include uh, those of you who are, I know some of you I see are volunteers here. You know, we, we, we try to get them into the object rotations in the museum a little more, try to do that in the last few years. Um, but there's a lot of stuff, uh, really cool stuff, uh, of grants, about grant in this collection. Um, and so today, that was, that's really the focus of, of what I did. I tried to select some interesting items on Grant. Again, most of them are paper. There's not that much 3D stuff. Most of them are letters and things like that. Um, that just kind of, they're, they're cool objects in our collection. They give you kind of a snapshot of different stages of Grant's life and career and who Grant was. So uh, a lot of other places across the country today are doing programs to commemorate Grant's birthday. Um, and so I'm, I'm leaving it to them to, uh, to you know, get into the nuts and bolts of Grant's life and, uh, and, and interpreting his life and his legacy and things like that. What today was really about these objects and what these objects can tell us about Grant. Um, but I will give a quick overview for those of you, um, you know, who, who uh, may not know as much about Grant. Ulysses S. Grant was born on April 27, 1822, um, and he had a whole different name. His name was Hiram Ulysses Grant. Um, later in life, when he gets into West Point, they change his name to Ulysses S. Grant. He is the second, or the, he's the first of two U.S. presidents with the middle initial S that means nothing, uh, Truman being the other one um, that stands for nothing. Uh, his father was Jesse Root Grant, and his mother was Hannah Simpson Grant, and he was born at Point Pleasant, Ohio. His father was a tanner, um, and Grant grows up in a kind of lower middle class home in Ohio. In 1839, he, uh, his father, uh, partly because of his father's advocacy, he ends up at West Point. His father really valued education um, and uh, knew that a West Point um, education at that time uh, was one of the best educations you could get in the United States and that it was something he had the right connections politically to get Grant into West Point. Um, so again, something you know, Grant, Grant and Lincoln share is a, is a commitment to education. Um, Grant, uh, Grant graduates and uh, he is assigned to Jefferson Barracks in St. Louis in 1843 uh, where he meets Julia Dent who will become his wife. 
Um, he proposes to her uh, in 1844, but they do not get married right away because Grant goes off to fight in the Mexican War. And in the Mexican-American War, Grant serves very well. Um, and it's where he starts to earn his reputation. When he comes back from the war, he marries Julia. And then he's assigned to the West Coast. And Grant is miserable on the West Coast. He's isolated. He misses his family. He doesn't like it out there very much. Um, it's where some of the rumors of his alcoholism begin, because uh, uh, some of the ways that he copes with uh, his loneliness out there is through drinking. Um, and uh, he eventually resigns his commission as an officer in the US Army in 1854. And he moves to St. Louis, where he tries to eke out a living as a farmer uh, on part of um, his father-in-law's estate. And he does not do very well um, at that. Uh, uh, and he ends up moving to Illinois in 1860. Uh, he moves to Galena, which is where his father is living at the time, and he works in his father's store. Uh, and that's where Grant is when the Civil War breaks out. Uh, when the Civil War breaks out, um, Grant, uh, Grant says la uh, later in life, he says that um, if he had been able to, he doesn't have residency status in Illinois yet because he's here so recently. If he had been able to vote, he would have voted for Douglas. So Grant is a Democrat when he comes to Illinois. Um, one of the things I want to emphasize in this talk is the way the war changes Grant's politics, like it does a lot of people um, in the United States, uh, especially in the Army. A lot of um, military uh, men who enlist in the Union Army, their opinion, their uh, political affiliations and their opinions on slavery um, definitely change, and Grant is one of those people. Um, he, uh, uh, he's what we would call a, union, uh, a, a unionist Democrat um, who oppose, uh, oppose the idea of secession, and so when the South secedes, Grant enlists back in the U.S. Army. Um, he comes here uh, to Springfield for a while. If you've been to the old state capitol, you can see where his office was. When he was here for a while, he ends up in command of the 21st Illinois Regiment, and then through various successes, uh, you know, works his way up through the Union Army. I'm not going to give you the whole history of Grant during the Civil War. Um, but as you all know, he becomes the hero of Fort Donelson. Uh, he uh, is part of the victory at Shiloh, which is a, a defeat that they turn into a victory. Um, and uh, of course, ends up um, capturing the city of Vicksburg through a brilliant campaign that results in a siege, uh, which makes him, uh, eventually elevates him to command of all Union forces in the Civil War, which is the role he occupies when uh, Robert E. Lee surrenders to him at Appomattox Courthouse. So that's my very quick overview. Um, I have some l objects and letters pulled, and actually this first one I have a transcription for, because one of the problems with these 19th century letters is sometimes they're not easy to read. So we're going to start in the middle of the Civil War um, in 1863. And what we have is a letter, I already forgot, what we have is a letter to Grant and a letter from Grant. So why don't I bring my transcription over here. This is the one I can actually read without. I can just show it to you while I read it. So Grant is, as I mentioned, a rising star in the Union Army. And Americans then and now love generals and want to give them political office. And so in December of 1863, uh, when Grant has already taken uh, Vicksburg, right? Vicksburg falls the day after the last day at Gettysburg on July 4th, 1863. Grant is now in command of, uh, or is, is working his way up to becoming in command of all Union forces. And this letter is from a fellow named Barnabas Burns. And Barnabas Burns is uh, on the Ohio Democratic um, State Committee, what we would call a state committee today. And I'm only going to read you a bit of this letter. So this is him writing to Grant at the end of, the, of 1863. He says, you will be no doubt surprised to find yourself addressed by a stranger upon a subject somewhat foreign to one which uh, has so fully occupied your attention for the last two years or more. A portion of the democracy, that's what they used, the Democrats used to call themselves, a portion of the democracy of this and other states in the Northwest finding it impossible to cooperate with that portion of the party which opposed the war. So again, Democrats, as some of you might know, Democrats split during the Civil War between those who opposed the whole, right? I remember I mentioned Union Democrats. There are Democrats who, wanna, who think the Union must be preserved at all, you know, and are in favor of the war, and there are some Democrats who say let the South go. So that's what they're, they're talking about. 
So these are war Demo or these are war Democrats, Union Democrats writing to Grant. Um, uh, and everything which looks to a speedy termination of the war by military power have formed a separate organization. In Ohio, we have fully organized by the appointment of a state central committee and of which I have the honor to be chairman. We have a mass convention in Columbus, Ohio on the 8th of January, 1864 to appoint delegates to a national convention to be held in Cincinnati in May next. Um, the same steps have been taken in all the northwestern states and portions of the middle and eastern states. At the convention to be held on the 8th in Columbus, uh, it may be desirable to express the preference of the war democracy for some gentleman for the presidency. Your successful military career, your unfaltering devotion to our country in its darkest hours of trial, your indomitable energy in overcoming all obstacles, your consummate skill and your indomitable energy in overcoming all obstacles, your, uh, or, sorry, and your dauntless courage on the field of battle have all combined to call the public mind to you as the man to whom the affairs of this great nation should be committed at the close of the present incumbent's term of office. I will finish reading there. So he's, asked, he's asking Grant if he'll be the candidate that at least Ohio Democrats will nominate for the presidency in the upcoming 1864 election. Remember I said at the beginning of the war, Grant is a Democrat. Throughout the war, that opinion changes. At this point, Grant, you'll see as his response, is trying not to be political at all. So this is a two-page letter that Grant writes in response. Here's the first page, and here's the second page with Grant's signature. Grant writes back uh, on December 17th, so he writes back the following week, and here's what Grant says. I think it's really interesting what Grant says. Grant says, your letter of the seventh instant asking if uh, you will be at liberty to use my name before the convention of the war democracy as candidate for the office of the presidency is just received. The question astonishes me. I do not know of anything I have ever done or said which would indicate I could be a candidate for any office, whatever within the gift of the people. I shall continue to do my duty to the best of my ability so long as permitted to remain in the army, supporting whatever administration may be in power in their endeavor to suppress the rebellion and maintain national unity, and never desert it because my vote, if I had one, might have been cast for a different candidate. So I'm gonna let it go there, There's, he says more, but. My point is, this is giving you a snapshot of Grant in the middle of the war, and Grant is being a good soldier, right? What Grant is saying is, my job is not political, right? I will serve whoever is in charge of the country, but notice he does give a bit of a caveat. He says he will serve whoever is in charge in trying to suppress the rebellion, right? Grant believes you have to suppress the rebellion, but he doesn't care whether it's a Democrat or a Republican. He's a soldier. He's going to fight for whoever it is in um, trying to win the war, and of course, that's what Grant does. And so our next document from April 2nd, 1865, um, let me make sure I got that date right. <laughs> yes, yeah, so on April 2nd, 1865, that morning, the Confederate capital at Richmond, right, for the entire Civil War, Grant or Lincoln has been frustrated because the Confederates, uh, the Confederates put up such a great defense in Virginia, right? The Virginia theater of the war is a stalemate throughout it, and one of the goals of that campaign had always been to capture Richmond, the capital of the Confederacy. It finally falls that morning. And Lincoln, so at this point now, this is a snapshot of Lincoln and Grant. Now these two are partners, right? Grant is at the beginning of forming a close relationship with Lincoln in that last letter. Now Grant and Lincoln are completely simpatico, and this is what Lincoln tells Grant. Lieutenant General Grant, allow me, and by the way, Lieutenant General too, right? He's the first general since Washington to hold that, uh, to hold that rank in the US Army. Allow me to tender to you and all with you the nation's grateful thanks for this uh, for this additional and magnificent success. At your kind suggestion, I think I will visit you tomorrow. And of course, we all know Lincoln does just that. He goes and visits uh, Richmond, and that's one of the best Lincoln stories, right? He shows up, even though it's dangerous, he shows up, he tours the city, he goes to Confederate White House. This is him tendering uh, or, or offering his gratefulness to Grant. Um, and Lincoln and Grant didn't always see eye to eye either. One of the interesting things about Grant, one of the things that sets Grant apart from some of his predecessors like George McClellan, 
is Grant and Lincoln do have a kind of working relationship. Grant is able to modify his strategic decisions around Lincoln's suggestions, and Lincoln is willing to do the same. And so they have a real relationship. And, and there's, there's even another letter uh, uh, where, where Lincoln admits to Grant that Grant had an idea that Lincoln opposed, and it turns out Grant was right. And so here is Grant's, Grant and Lincoln's grand strategy for defeating the, the Confederacy coming to fruition, and Lincoln is grateful. That gets us out of the Civil War. Most of the objects that I dug up here are, uh, are from after the Civil War. The only thing I'd like to point out um, that illustrates this, this uh, cooperation that I showed is this sculpture. So this sculpture is called uh, the Council of War. Um, and uh, it, is, uh, uh, it is sculpted by a, a sculptor named John Rogers, who Edwin M. Stanton uh, uh, personally selects. Um, Stanton is the third person in this sculpture, all right? So you have Stanton and Grant sitting with Lincoln, right? This is supposed to illustrate that collaboration that I talked about. This is supposed to embody how the three of them, of course, Stanton, no, Stanton commissions it, so that's why he gets himself in there. And Stanton was an important person in the Union War effort, but it's probably a little more Grant and Lincoln than it is with Stanton in there. But no, they're all conferring together, they're close together, and they are formulating the, the strategy, right? This is commissioned at the end of the war, so this is them collaborating to form the strategy that will win the war. This particular a um, uh, bronze uh, 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 copy of this sculpture is actually the original plaster cast that had been bronzed, created by Rogers, which he gifts to Robert Todd Lincoln. So this is Robert Todd Lincoln's personal copy that he kept, at Hill, uh, kept in his various homes, including at Hildeen. Um, and so that's kind of cool too. That, and and Robert, um, Robert believed that the likeness of Lincoln on this one was the best likeness that anybody did of his dad. So interesting point there. All right, let's move to after the war. So um, of course, uh, you know, Grant, um, one, of the, one of the major achievements that Grant has during the war is that Grant finally gets Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia to surrender at Appomattox Courthouse. And um, the surrender terms that Grant works up uh, are kind of famous as being magnanimous. Um, among those, uh, and I keep going back and forth here because I want to make sure I read it correctly. Among, the way the surrender terms that Grant writes ends is with this passage. Uh, Grant writes, officers and men, these are Confederate officers and men in, in Lee's army, officers and men will be allowed to return to their homes, not to be disturbed by the United States authority as long as they observe their parole and the laws in force where they may reside. This means a few things, but one of the things that it means is that members of the Army of Northern Virginia, therefore, cannot be charged with treason, right? Because they were traitors. They took up arms against the United States in an organized way. Uh, Robert E. Lee led them. According to you know, the laws of the nation, that's punishable, right? And Grant is saying here, as long as you respect your parole, right, as long as you behave yourselves, the United, Sta the, uh, the United States authority, right, will not, um, will not disturb them, all right? So, what's happening here in this letter? Well, this is a letter from Robert E. Lee to Ulysses S. Grant. It's one of the coolest things in our collection. Um, that he is writing to Grant uh, after the Civil War because um, Andrew Johnson's presidency is a complicated presidency, as I'm sure you all know. And, and among the things Andrew Johnson does that gets Johnson in a lot of trouble and ends up getting him impeached is uh, he um, issues a series of pardons for Confederates and, uh, you know, for various reasons. One of them, the language of such, uh, the language of one of those pardons is such that Lee is worried that he is now going to be, that he can now be charged with treason. Um, and so what he's doing here is he's writing to Grant and he's telling Grant, remember what you said in the surrender terms, please reiterate that to President Johnson so I don't get charged with treason. So what he says here is, and we'll see if I can read it, it's a little dark. Um, Upon reading the president's uh, formulation of the, and then he gives the date, I came to Richmond to, um, to ascertain what was proper or required of me to do when I learned that with others I was to be uh, indebted, uh, indicted for treason. And then he says, uh, by grand jury, blah, 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 blah. So he's asking Grant, please remind him of this. And then on the back, uh, 
There's Grant's reply. So Grant does what Lee asks. He passes this along, and he endorses what Lee says in this long passage that he is directing to the Secretary of War. There's another one in the collection. I talked to our manuscript librarian this yesterday that he sends to the president as well, saying, yeah, Robert E. Lee is right. You can't charge Robert E. Lee with treason by the terms of the Appomattox surrender. So it's an interesting document because it's a post, it, these two guys on opposing parts of the battlefield they are, they are now communicating with each other to ensure that the, that treaty is maintained. It's also, I believe, the only document where they have both signed it, all right? You have Grant's signature down here, and you have Robert E. Lee's signature at the bottom of this. So really special letter in our collection. Um, so, um, and again, this is Grant. I mean, I, I, one thing to think about that letter because it will, you know, you'll see in the rest of these documents, as Grant's political career gets underway, as he, sh uh, underway, as he shifts from a, uh, from a military person to a political person, Grant will spend a lot of his time dealing with the resistance by former Confederates and white Southerners against the policies of Reconstruction, against the policies of the Republican Party, which Grant is now a member of, right? Grant, by the end of the war, Grant believes in emancipation. He believes in protecting at least some civil rights of African Americans in the South, and he will spend a lot of his time, a lot of his time in office combating those issues. This letter, if you put that, this letter within that context, right, but here he is telling Lee he will get charged with treason, it's very similar to that first letter, right? Grant is a military man. Grant wrote that treaty, and Grant says that treaty has to be respected, right? And Robert E. Lee also has done what he asked him to do, right? Robert E. Lee did just mind his own business in Richmond, all right? He doesn't violate the terms of his parole, and so Grant is doing what he would do as a general in telling Lee, yeah, or telling the president and telling the Secretary of War, yeah, you can't charge Lee with treason. But then Grant runs for office. So this is Grant, uh, this is a uh, political cartoon from Grant's first campaign for office in 1868. One of the things I want to point out is that one of the ways the Republicans campaign against Democrats in the aftermath of the war is by quote unquote waving the bloody shirt, right? That they're the party that won the Civil War and that if you elect Democrats, Democrats are going to reverse um, some of the things that, uh, you know, that the, all those soldiers achieved fighting the Confederacy. So notice the header is blood will tell, right? Or the footer is blood will tell, right? As Grant here as a horse with his vice presidential candidate, uh, Schuyler Colfax riding on him is running ahead of uh, Seymour, the, uh, the um, Democratic candidate for president. And I love what Grant is saying. There's Grant smiling. And what Grant is saying, where is it? Um, he says, it comes so natural. I can fight it out on this line if it takes all summer, which is, of course, a quote that he gave Lincoln during the Civil War uh, when he is saying that he can continue to fight the Confederates even if it takes all summer. So they're using a Civil War quote. They're absolutely using Grant's record as a general here to get him elected. And, of course, Grant wins, right? Grant serves as president for two terms. This is an artifact from his 1872 campaign. Let me shove this under here. Um, uh, Wilson on that is Henry Wilson, a Massachusetts senator who Grant runs alongside. Um, he will defeat Horace Greeley. At this point, the Democrats are such a toxic brand uh, in the post-war uh, in the post-war political scene that um, Horace Greeley actually runs on a different ticket. They, he runs as a um, again, it's complicated, but he ends up running as a liberal Republican, um, and. Uh, and Grant, of course, will win again. He actually wins by an even larger margin. Um, against, um, against Seymour, Grant wins by a large electoral college margin and about 300,000 popular votes. He defeats Greeley even more, um, and an even more lopsided victory. Um, so it's telling um, that uh, how successful Grant is as a politician, um, and, uh, and the fortunes of the Republican Party in post-war America, even as they're trying to manage Reconstruction. And Grant's presidency has been one of the most controversial parts of his legacy. Um, and we can get into this a little bit more detail later, but um, if you want to, but you know, Grant's presidency has, is often characterized as being a particularly corrupt presidency, as a failure, 
right? For the last few decades, there's been a major reevaluation of Grant's presidency going on among historians. Because while, while there were certainly corruption scandals during Grant's presidency, Grant's presidency was also very much an effort to make Reconstruction work, right? That in the aftermath of Andrew Johnson, we're gonna get Grant, the guy who defeated the South in charge, and he's going to clean up what's going on in the South uh, in the aftermath of the Civil War, right? In the aftermath of the Civil War, African Americans are given uh, the right to vote, right? They're awarded their freedom in the 13th Amendment, they're given the right to vote in the 15th Amendment, and the 14th Amendment ensures certain civil rights to all Americans, right? All these things are products of Reconstruction. And White Southerners, um, white supremacist Southerners react to this largely through violence. They use violence, the Ku Klux Klan, to suppress the African American vote in the South, um, to ensure that African Americans not only are not allowed to influence politics, but that they are not allowed to serve office. And Grant's presidency in, uh, tries to fight back against this. Um, and so I will, at the, but the other part about Grant's presidency there's two things going on with Grant's presidency, and, and the, the three things I've selected, I didn't do this on purpose, but worked out this way, illustrate all these different things. So the other thing that Grant's presidency will be very preoccupied with is the thing that America was very preoccupied with before the Civil War begins, which is expanding westward, right? And so Grant, which is gonna present a different aspect of Grant's legacy regarding race, right? While Grant is trying to protect the rights of African Americans in the South, he is, conquering and displacing uh, indigenous peoples in the American West. So we'll get a little bit into that. He's also revisiting the um, long-standing conflict uh, or, very, or po difficult politics of the 19th century between the United States and Mexico. So this is a, uh, a commission by Grant when he is president um, that our manuscript librarian turned me on to. Um, which um, I had to look up the story of it, and it's actually pretty interesting, and it is right in with the conflict uh, or growing conflicts between the United States and Mexico. It is an 1872 appointment of special commissioners. He appoints these three commissioners to go down to Mexico and investigate raids that, they, uh, that people in Texas have been complaining to the federal government that um, veterans, Mexican veterans, that Mexico is intentionally settling its veterans along the border so that they will raid um, into Texas, uh, particularly to steal cattle. Um, and so Congress appoints these three guys to go down and investigate those raids. And so what this is, is this is Grant signing off uh, on that appointment. Um, they, and they agree. Um, they come back, um, they uh, report that um, raids from Mexico have caused 48 million uh, in damages. Um, and there's no kind of immediate action taken, but this is part of a much longer story that I don't have time to get into now, that will go on for years and years after Grant is president, of these grow, of where the, the Texas border, right, is vulnerable, right, and where um, Mexican, the Mexican government and the US government are constantly complaining that the other is violating that border in one way or another. And so this is Grant dealing with that issue. Another thing that, um, and again, you, you always have to be careful when you talk about things in our collection that we didn't know were there, you don't want to say they were discovered because they were always here. But sometimes there's things in our collection that you know, we haven't realized they're here yet or, or you know, that it's been forgotten that they were here. So I like to say these things are uncovered. This is one of the coolest things about Grant that we've uncovered or that uh, since I've been around that we've uncovered in our collection. We have a collection where we have a group of these little note cards so there's a whole bunch of these little note cards, some of which appear to be in Grant's hand, some of which appear to be in someone else's hand, probably the secretary's hand, then signed by Grant, potentially. And what they appear to be, and I love these because it illustrates he used to be a general when he's president, right? What they are is they're little quick orders that Grant is signing and I guess handing off to somebody to go do something, all right? So like Lincoln didn't do this, or at least not that we know of, right? But we have a bunch of these in our collection from Grant. And they're just little orders. And so we had a look at them, and I picked two, and they turned out to both intersect with pretty significant um, events, although I didn't know that when I picked them. Um, so this one, he's, there's a little date at the top. This is September 17th, 1874. And Grant is writing, the Secretary of War will order eight companies of the 22nd Infantry to New Orleans without delay. All right? Why is Grant sending 
US troops to New Orleans in 1874. That's because one of the uh, worst uh, white supremacist um, uh, insurrections uh, in Southern history during Reconstruction is taking place at that time. Um, there has been an, a gubernatorial election uh, in New Orleans, um, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's uh, both sides do not accept the results of the election. Um, the uh, the Republican, the pro-Grant Republicans, don't accept the results of the election because they believe, uh, correctly so, that white supremacist Southerners have used violence to suppress the Republican vote, particularly among African Americans. Um, but um, long story short, the federal government ends up endorsing the pro-Grant candidate. White supremacists in the South dispute this because they think they won the election, and they say that the federal government is overstepping its bounds. As you know, these kind of conflicts happen a lot in United States history. <laughs> so 5,000 armed white supremacists, most are Confederate veterans, storm New Orleans and seize control of the state legislature and the armory to try to seat their own, they unseat the pro-grant um, uh, uh, gubernatorial candidate and they try to seat their own. Um, they call themselves the Crescent City White League. So they make no, <laughs> there's no illusion what these guys are about and what their motivation is. Um, and uh, they end up, um, uh, they end up in a armed confrontation with about 3,500 uh, local police and militia led by, in part by, James Longstreet, the former Confederate general who after the war becomes a Republican and is a friend of Ulysses S. Grant's. And his involvement in this will forever shape his legacy because it's one of the reasons why, and I can go way deep on this but we don't have time right now, but part of the reason why Confederate veterans hate Longstreet and end up blaming him for the defeat at Gettysburg is because of this, because they see him as a race traitor because he supports uh, the pro-grant candidate at what becomes known as the Battle of Liberty Place. Um, and so this is a major event in the history of Reconstruction. And uh, Grant, what we see then, what we have in this note card, is we have a literal snapshot. What ends up, what ends up happening is for three days, these white supremacists remain in, com in uh, control of the State House and the Armory. What gets rid of them is the arrival of federal troops which it, because it takes them three days to get there. That card is the moment Grant orders those troops to put this down, all right? This is Grant directly intervening in a civil rights political conflict in New Orleans. Um, and I mean, some of you might know too, this becomes a controversial thing because subsequently um, when, uh, and you know, we can get into the monument controversy if you want, but this was one of the, when the monument controversy started in this country in the last few years, this was a major site for that because there, is, there was a monument at Liberty Place commemorating the fight at Liberty Place, but it was not in favor of the police who defended um, the, you know, the legitimate governor and the US troops who put it down. It was in defense of the White League who took over um, the State House. Um, and it was eventually taken, it was one of the first monuments to come down um, because, uh, you know, it represented a, um, let's say, biased view of that conflict. So that's, that's Grant dealing with um, civil rights in the South, but I mentioned he's also dealing with Western expansion. And I really kind of lucked out with this card because I didn't know what this card was about when I picked it, but it ends up being really cool. So this one is not in Grant's handwriting, it looks like, but it looks like he may have signed it with his initials. Um, and it's longer. He says, ask General Logan, another Illinois guy, right? Ask General Logan if he uh, would please push through um, as soon as possible the bill authorizing uh, Commander Emery to retire with the rank of Brigadier General. General Sheridan, right? Sheridan has replaced Grant in charge of all uh, US soldiers, right? Because Grant's president. General Sher Sheridan is anxious to have Colonel Merritt who will, uh, who will be promoted, uh, oh, who, yeah, who will be promoted by Emory's retirement to take command of an expedition, of, of the expedition now started. So what is Grant talking about? Well, first of all, that ties into the story I just told you. So those US soldiers who enter New Orleans and put down the uh, white supremacist insurgent revolt there are led by uh, Emory. Um, so that's who Emory is, William H. Emory. 
But Grant is replacing Emory, right? Why is he replacing Emory? Because Sheridan doesn't like him. Um, two reasons. One, Sheridan doesn't like Emory, so we're going to give him the boot. This is two years later. This is in 76. So we're going to kick him out. Um, the other reason is because Grant is about to, um, the department that was in charge of New Orleans is about to be incorporated into the much bigger Department of Missouri. And the Department of Missouri is, sure, still very much focused on reconstruction and suppressing insurrections in the South, but it's also very concerned with westward expansion and dealing with indigenous peoples who are resisting westward expansion. So Merritt, right, who's Merritt in that, um, in that letter? Merritt, or in that note, is Wesley Merritt. And uh, Wesley Merritt ends up in command of this division, which puts him in charge of the 5th Cavalry. All right, this is on June 22nd, 1876 is when Grant orders this. At the end of the month, Merritt is given the command that Grant is requesting. What expedition is Grant talking about in that, um, in that note? Well, what I think he's talking about is a planned expedition by the 5th Cavalry to assist in suppressing the revolt of the... Uh, the Sioux uprising um, in the West. And who is a key figure in suppressing that, uh, that uprising when this order is issued? Custer. And shortly after that note is issued, the, uh, the Battle of Little Bighorn takes place, and Custer and his entire command are annihilated. So what happens to Merritt when he gets out there is Merritt ends up in command of the 5th Cavalry, and it's his cavalry that pursue the forces that defeated Custer and end up defeating them and you know, extracting their vengeance on them at the Battle of Slim Butts shortly thereafter. So that is... Again, a direct, you know, we, this, is, this letter, or this little note of Grant's, you know, has direct implications for the history of, um, of Grant's presidency and of Western expansion. So pretty cool to see Grant um, doing these things. Um, let's step back for a little bit, because I want to leave some time for q and I've got a couple more things to talk about that have more to deal with Grant's uh, life story then. Um, right next to me, uh, in uh, this frame piece, is an invitation to the wedding of Grant's daughter, Nellie, um, from May 21st, 1874. Nellie moves into, when Grant moves into the White House, Nellie is 13. So that's going to mean that very soon after her arrival in the White House, as, during Grant's first term, and especially in his second term, Nellie is going to be of suiting age. And so Grant, um, is actually pretty uncomfortable with this, right? Now, immediately, uh, members of the Washington political class begin uh, courting Nellie and suiting Nellie. Uh, Grant, um, Grant, when she's 16, right? So 16 would be when that would really get underway. Grant actually sends her off to England to get her away from all these guys, um, where she meets Queen Victoria and she has a lovely time. But on her way back from England, this backfires on Grant, because on her way back from England, she meets... Algernon Charles Frederick, um, it's spelled Sartorius, but it's pronounced, I think it's Sartorius, it's pronounced a different way, um, on the way back, uh, and she falls in love with him on the boat. Well, imagine this is kind of like Titanic. And um, shortly thereafter, uh, except this guy's uh, no, no, uh, no Jack, because uh, he, he asked Grant permission to marry Nellie. Um, Grant is uncomfortable about it, because this guy has, he's kind of a, um, He's kind of a well-to-do English guy, but he, he has no job. Um, and he kind of, in Grant's opinion, he has no prospects. Um, so Grant is reluctant at first to uh, endorse the match, but Nellie is head over heels for this guy, um, and Grant relents. And that's who she is marrying um, uh, in this, with this wedding invitation. Turns out Grant was right. The marriage turns out to not be so good a one, and, and they end up getting divorced, which, as you know, is a rare thing. And in part, that's because he ends up potentially um, cheating on her. He may have had alcohol problems. Um, and so she kind of divorces him on the ground that he's not really around. He's not really fulfilling his duties as, um, as her husband. So kind of tragic story there. Um, let's talk a little about Grant's legacy and his relationship to Lincoln again before we finish. This is one of my favorite Grant letters in the collection. Um, I may have to take it out here to read the part, yeah. So this is 1880 on April 21st, so we're, we're pretty late in Grant's life now. Grant is here in Illinois, he is in Galena again, um, and what's happening here, he's writing this to Stephen Logan, right, Lincoln's former partner, um, and a few other Springfield bigwigs, both Republicans and Democrats. 
they have invited him to come here. Um, and uh, Grant is saying no, because uh, he's saying he doesn't have time. But he goes out of his way in this letter to talk about Lincoln and the relationship we have with Lincoln. And that's why I like this so much. If any of you were here and we did our four presidents exhibit uh, where we covered Grant, this letter was in that exhibit. Um, and what Grant says is, I appreciate this invitation coming as it does from the citizens of the capital of the state, quote, uh, in quotes, without distinction of party. So they must have said this to him when they sent him, right? Both Republicans and Democrats want you to come here. And recognizing, too, the propriety of revisiting the home of the martyr to whom the nation owes so much. So that's Lincoln, right? He wants to come here. He wants to visit Springfield where Lincoln is from and to whom I was personally so much indebted for constant support through all, uh, through all detractions, though an entire stranger to him, except officially. So what Grant is saying here is what he likes about Lincoln, the thing that makes, uh, the, the thing that gives Lincoln a special place in his heart, is that although Grant, Lincoln did not know Grant personally, Lincoln recognized in Grant, Grant's quality as a leader, and Lincoln, throughout the Civil War, right, supported and elevated Grant, even through hard times. Um, and Grant remembers that about Lincoln, and he wants to say this to all of Lincoln's old lawyer buddies and political buddies here in Illinois when they're trying to get him to come visit. And this print, this is a pretty wide, uh, famous print, illustrates that. This is an 1868 print of Grant visiting Lincoln's tomb. This is the second tomb, right before they built the big one. Um, and it's, you, you run into this in all kinds of different places. This is a pretty widespread print. Again, they would make these prints, they would publish them in newspapers, and then people would buy them and put them in their homes. And this is Grant paying his respects to Lincoln and captured in this way. We don't have a photograph of it, but we do have this. And it's great that it's in color. So the last chapter of Grant's life, as I'm sure you all know, though, is um, through various uh, uh, business um, kind of Poor business decisions uh, where Grant is manipulated uh, to get involved in some shady investment schemes. Grant ends up pretty broke by the end of his life. Um, and Grant is worried about his legacy at the end of his life, but he's especially worried about the well-being of his family. Um, because, uh, you know, as president and through all these things, Grant had amassed a pretty good fortune. Um, he, uh, there's this weird situation where when he retires as president, like all these people offer him houses he can go live in in different places, and Grant ends up, um, uh, Grant ends up in New York. Um, but he, uh, but he's out of money by the end of his life. So, he, one of the things that, um, and again, this is part of a broader trend, right? One of the things that happens after the Civil War is the generation after the Civil War generation is um, extremely enthusiastic about hearing, right? They, they, they know they've got, the, the, you know, everybody in the generation above them was involved in the war. These guys are all getting old, especially the generals like Grant. And so they want to, you know, we, we went through something similar with the World War II generation or are going through something similar with the World War II generation. You want to get stories out of these guys before they pass on. Furthermore, all these guys, they've all got access to grind from their time in the war too. So they want to get their stories out because they want to blame James Longstreet for the defeat at Gettysburg. Or they want to say that it was Grant's brilliant generalship that led to Lee's defeat and not, you know, something else, right? Not just superior your numbers, um, right? These guys all have these access to grind too. So you get this flood of first articles in prominent magazines by Civil War veterans, especially commanders, talking about their wartime experiences. And a lot of it's to preserve their memory in print, and a lot of it is to, is to air these grievances. And Grant is among them. So Grant starts writing articles, I think it's for Century Magazine, where he goes over some of his memories of some of the major battles he participated in. Well, over time, this movement grows, right? And what happens is everybody who did anything in the Civil War eventually ends up publishing a memoir, right? There's this flood of literature from all these guys in this generation, um, especially anyone who was a commander, um, reminiscing about their time in the Civil War. But Grant is one of the holdouts. Um, again, it's funny, all the kind of biggest guys are the holdouts. Um, and Grant is one of the holdouts. So um, he originally ends up being offered um, yeah, again, Grant's not a great businessman. And Grant is originally offered the opportunity to publish his memoirs, and uh, the deal he agrees to is that he will get 
of, uh, of whatever money gets made off that memoir. That is a terrible deal. <laughs> this is Ulysses S. Grant, for crying out loud, right? This, this book is gonna make a ton of money. It's still making money, right, today. And so this is a horrible deal for Ulysses S. Grant. And so um, Mark Twain discovers that Grant has made this horrible deal, and he goes to see Grant, and he tells Grant that that is a terrible idea, and instead, the best model to sell his memoirs is to write his memoirs and make them a subscription. Back then, this is the best, you know, this was a good business model, that people would subscribe to receive the book once Grant finished it, and that Grant would get 70% of those subscription fees, which sounds pretty good to Grant, and he's in financial dire straits, so Grant writes his memoir. The, the miracle of Grant's memoir, there's a, a few things that make Grant's memoir especially uh, special. This is the first edition, okay, this is volume one, volume two is down there. What makes Grant's memoir so special, first of all, is it is very readable and very well written. Um, it is generally believed to be the best political memoir ever written by a US president. Um, Grant's writing style is very clear and concise, so concise that um, the story has always been that Mark Twain helped him write it. That is not true. <laughs> um, he definitely took some advice from Mark Twain, but Grant mostly did this himself. He also did it, especially volume two, very quickly. Um, and part of this is, I think you can credit to Grant's skill as a general, right? Grant was an effective general, and one of the things that made Grant such an effective general is he was really good at communicating with his subordinates. You knew exactly what Grant wanted. If Grant wrote you a letter, it was very clear. I mean, I hope that's come across in some of the things I've read to you today. It definitely comes across in his correspondence with Robert E. Lee over the Appomattox surrender. Grant is being very clear with Lee about what his expectations are of Lee and his army. Grant was a good writer, and that comes across in these memoirs. And so in that way, they're very special. But the other way that they're very special is Grant ends up diagnosed with throat cancer, right? One of the things we all know about Grant is he loved to smoke his cigars. Grant gets diagnosed with throat cancer, and he is writing the memoirs as he is dying of throat cancer. And he races to finish them before that, in part because of his legacy, but mostly because this is his family's meal ticket, right? He needs his family to be supported with the money that these make. And he literally finishes it days before he passes on, that he is able to get this done. And it actually shows a little, because the first volume has a little more, the second volume, especially by the end, gets very much to, you know, well, then I marched here, then we fought here, then we whatever. You can kind of tell as you go through the second volume that Grant's starting to rush. He just wants to get the details out. Um, and he's not doing it all from memory, too. The other thing I should point out is Grant is calling in favors from his subordinates, from people who are with him. Uh, he's using some of the documents end up in the official records of the War of the Rebellion to rebuild these campaigns. So he's doing research, too. He's not just doing a, a lot of this off the dome. Um, but he ends, up, um, he ends up finishing it. It makes a ton of money. It is still uh, cons widely considered um, to be one of the best political memoirs, although it's often under the radar. There's a new edition. Um, that uh, the Ulysses S. Grant papers published a few years ago, an annotated edition, which is excellent. So if you're interested in reading Grant's memoirs, I highly recommend that edition, um, edited by uh, John Marzalek and his staff. That's so you can tell which one it is. Um, uh, who now operate the Ulysses S. Grant Presidential Library uh, in Mississippi, where they're doing all kinds of stuff today to commemorate Grant's 200th anniversary too, so I encourage you to see what they're up to. Um, but anyway, it's very cool that we have first editions of this, because again, it's, it's, um, it's a real monument. You know, Grant builds his own kind of monument to himself before he dies, and uh, I think it's a wonderful story, and I think that's all I've got for you. So um, we'll do a little Q&A. If any of you have questions for me, we can do some Q&A. And then, um, you know, if you, if you file up, um, you're welcome to come get a closer look at any of these objects. Just please do not hold your phones or your cameras. You can take pictures, no flash, and please do not hold your phones over the barrier. Um, any questions for you, or Joe, any questions for me before we do that? Yes. Thank you. For those folks. Yes, sir. For those folks watching online, let me bring the microphone over oh. so they can hear your question. And we, by the way, we have uh, literally folks across the country from Washington, D.C., Lindsay, to Thomas in Washington State, who uh, added a comment that Nellie gets remarried to a fellow named Jones and is buried under the name Nellie Grant Jones near the Lincoln tomb here in Springfield. Mm -hmm. So 
So for those That's of you true. that like to do a little cemetery yeah. hunting, you could do that, I suppose. Yeah, like I said, I blew through some of these stories. So yeah, thanks yeah. for providing those and, details. And uh, even a gentleman watching in Venezuela. Oh, wow. And South America watching. So let's see what our question is. Well, I didn't get into Grant's Latin American foreign policy, but that's a whole thing with Grant, too, <laughs> that you can look up if you want so to. So, folks, if you have a question mm -hmm. online, feel free to chime in here. In the meantime, let's see what this gentleman has to say. I was noticing in your presentation you were uh, talking about Grant's legacy, and it is strange how Link Grant was so popular. You know, he goes on this world tour, but historians the Northern and Southern Democrats and the Liberal Republicans and the Mugwumps turn Grant's legacy into, well, Reconstruction was the result of a corrupt folly by a drunken butcher. And for generations, that's kind of the story that we hear. Yeah. And I thought maybe you might want to come back oh. into that sort of story. Also, yeah, about that's my jam. Democrats <laughs> because Grant, in your first presentation, is trying to make sure he's not dealing with the Peace Democrats or mm -hmm. the Copperheads that were very big up in the North. Yeah, I mean, that's part, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so, you know, what we call memory plays a huge role in Grant's story. Um, one of the things that happens after the Civil War is pro-Confederate Southerners. I talked about these axes to grind. The big axe that pro-Confederate Southerners have to grind is um, trying to create a new narrative for why the Civil War happened and why they lost. Um, and that narrative is built upon denying the centrality of slavery to the Confederate uh, movement um, and the Confederate war effort and to uh, demonstrating um, that, uh, you know, they fought, that, that a Confeder Confederates outfought the North. And the only reason the North won is because of its overwhelming numbers and an industry. And Grant comes to embody that in that narrative, that Ulysses S. Grant was not a, a good general, that Ulysses S. Grant was a butcher, um, a drunken butcher who only defeated the brilliant Robert E. Lee by hurling troops against him uh, and just overwhelming Lee. And Lee begins that myth himself with the, the, the letter that he writes to his troops immediately after Appomattox, where he tells them the only reason we lost is due to overwhelming numbers. Generation, the, the, those following generations that I, that I mentioned that come after, that I've talked about the monument in New Orleans, they're the ones who then popularize this myth. The Sons of Confederate Veterans and the United Daughters of the Confederacy um, embark on a program of endorsing that myth and popularizing it wherever they can. They put it into textbooks and they put it into monuments, which is why some of these monuments are so controversial. And the narrative is consistently that the war was not about slavery and the South was only overwhelmed. Um, and again, Grant becomes a major target. And that, that myth, uh, we call it the myth of the lost cause, right? That's what they call it. The lost cause interpretation of the Civil War becomes so dominant that it absolutely shapes Grant's memory for decades. And it's really only within the last few decades that Grant's uh, reputation has started to recover. Um, and, and part of that is because of work historians and others have done looking at what Grant actually did uh, and realizing that this narrative is out there and you know, trying to parse it out. So there's all these, I mean, that's a whole other talk we can do. There's all these competing narratives about what the Civil War was about um, that dominate the, the, America, the American popular culture for the decades after the Civil War. Um, and in some ways that argument is still going on today. So that's absolutely, Grant is the biggest victim on the northern side, Grant is the biggest victim. Of course, Lincoln is too, right? In that narrative, Lincoln is a tyrant who didn't care about slavery, um, and the entire war effort uh, on Lincoln's behalf was just to expand the power of the federal government. That's, that's the other um, part of that uh, narrative. All right, uh, got a couple of quick comments and a question off of the internet here. Uh, Tracy chimes in from England, says, the UK wishes US Grant a happy 200th. Uh, great to hear from England today. Uh, Ronald asking, Grant was a proponent of using black soldiers. Do you think Grant was okay with Buffalo sol soldiers killing Native Indians, but not okay with Sally Andrews, Fennell Jackson's Trail of Tears? I mean, that's a probably deeper question, I think, that I want to get into here, but absolutely, I mean, they didn't, um, you know, in Grant's mind, you know, we, we, we talk about race as a general thing now. I mean, in Grant's mind, um, Endorsing civil rights and the right to fight in the army for African Americans is a different issue than westward expansion. So, I mean, no, I don't think Grant would have given any thought. To, to him, there's no contradiction in using African American soldiers 
um, to expand the American empire westward. That, that, that wouldn't even have occurred to him as a conflict. Uh, Michelle online says, do we know how Grant felt after President Lincoln was murdered? Did he feel guilty about declining the offer to go to the theater with them that evening? Did he somehow feel that if he was there with him that he would have been able to save or perhaps stop Booth? I don't know that he ever says that. Um, uh, Grant, um, I mean, you know, <laughs> Grant declining that night, I mean, is, is, is a thing people talk about. I don't know that it's, it's as central to that as, I mean, it's central to Booth's plan. Um, I think if anyone is, is upset that Grant isn't there, it's not Grant, it's Booth, because Booth wanted to kill them both. Um, and, uh, but Grant is horrified, just like everybody else is. And as I tried to demonstrate a little bit, I mean, I blew through it pretty fast. That's what Grant's campaign is. Grant's presidential campaign in 68, and I don't think it's spin, is this guy represents Lincoln's legacy. You want to vote for Grant because Andrew Johnson has crapped all over Lincoln's legacy. <laughs> let's, get the, let's get a real Republican in office. Let's get Lincoln's legacy back in here. Let's get Ulysses S. Grant back in here. And that's why Grant does the things he does with um, trying to, uh, you know, reinforce reconstruction, protect black civil rights um, and voting rights, because that's all part of this legacy of, of Abraham Lincoln um, and the uh, wartime Republican Party. So um, that's the way Grant reacts to Lincoln's uh, assassination. I think, Any other did you questions? have a question here at the front? Any other questions here uh, in our in-person audience? Yes, sir. A little bit of a digression, but uh, we, we know all about uh, Grant, we have a positive view of Grant. Did McClellan ever write his memoirs? And uh, how do you think he comes out in history? McClellan does, I mean, McClellan, um, I've given talks here on McClellan before. McClellan has a kind of complicated legacy. He never has the kind of post-war uh, career Grant does. He does serve as governor of, it's New Jersey, right? For, I think, one term. Um, you know, McClellan, um, the most I'll say for McClellan is I think McClellan is a little misunderstood. Um, I think the strategy McClellan, McClellan's strategy for defeating the Confederacy ultimately does not work. Um, but I don't think it was entirely wrongheaded. I think McClellan was trying to win the war in a way um, that would prevent a lot of casualties. He was trying to maneuver Richmond into surrendering by cutting off supply lines and things like that. Um, obviously, the way that they end up defeating the Confederacy is not that way. It's by confronting Robert E. Lee directly, which, of course, was Robert E. Lee's strategy. Right? If you, Robert E. Lee's strategy is to bash at the Union Army, uh, at the U.S. Army, as much as possible um, in order to try to force them to surrender. And, and Grant, one of the reasons Grant is effective is because he uses that strategy against Lee and uses a similar strategy. And so McClellan, um, I don't, but, but you know, McClellan's biggest problem, and I've said this before, McClellan's biggest problem. Um, and this is somewhat related to the idea of, of his memoirs. McClellan's biggest problem is that his wife saves all his personal letters. And we talk a lot <laughs> about, because we are all, you know, here in the 21st century, especially us historians, we want these people of the past to save their letters as much as possible, right? But a lot of times they get rid of their personal letters. They don't want to share their most personal moments. They share their public letters, right? And we get mad at Robert Todd Lincoln for doing this with his mother, for instance, right? Well. Um, McClellan's wife saved all his letters. And in those letters, McClellan comes across as a huge jerk, and he probably was. And he comes across as a guy who really is exasperated with Abraham Lincoln and thinks Abraham Lincoln is a dope. And you're not going to get very far in the public eye thinking Abraham Lincoln is a dope. And so I think that's part of the reason why McClellan's reputation remains in the dirt uh, so much so is because we have these glimpses into his most private correspondent, you know, you'll tell your wife things about people in your life that you might not tell anybody else, and that's what McClellan's doing in these letters, so. Just checking the internet, uh, no additional questions, it appears. Any other questions we had one before over here, we finish Joe. up? Let's, one more down here in front, and then we'll uh, have everybody to come up and take a look. Yes. Do I remember correctly that that was the first wedding in the White House? I think you're, yes, I think you're right about that. I was say, Kate, my intern Katie knows, isn't that the first wedding in the White House? Yeah, yes, um, which is part of what makes it a big deal. It makes it a cool thing. So it's a shame it didn't work out better. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much. Yeah, come on up and have a look. And